So uh, it's always difficult to give presentations not seeing your audience. And uh, I remember previous meetings where there was a lively interaction with uh, all of you. Uh, but uh, we have to cope with um, how the situation is. So um, I'm, I'm very happy that we have a combined uh, uh, session now, uh, also uh, uh, discussing the quality of life and uh, novel methods to, uh, to get insight into uh, what patients uh, do about uh, their side effects and how they look at their disease. So um, uh, I, I, I hope it, it's worthwhile for you um to to uh, to to be active in i would say not only to listen but to uh, to be active and if there are any questions in between i will uh, will be happy to answer that and there will be time for discussion afterwards so um my lecture is uh, on the, the medical side of long ter term survivorship on tkis in gist and uh, especially the the medical clinical facts so uh, I think you will realize we have our 20 year uh, birthday of uh, the first TKI in GIST. Uh, the first publication was a little more than 20 years ago in the prestigious uh, New England Journal of Medicine, uh, which is the, one of the top journals in, uh, in, in, in medicine. And uh, I think you all know the story that Heike Yunsi uh, had a patient uh, who was in good connection with the chief of Novartis in the US, and they were aware of a uh, medication called STI-571 at that time, uh, later imatinib, uh, that was used for uh, uh, CML because it hits uh, BCR able, but they found out that it also hits uh, CKIT and uh, that the gist that was a newly recognized disease uh, was driven by activated uh, kit. So uh, as you can see from this PET scan, this patient uh, had uh, quite extensive disease and uh, only after, uh, I think it was two weeks, uh, a new PET scan uh, revealed uh, almost clean PET scan. So it was really a breakthrough and everyone was extremely excited and um, the development of uh, imatinib went really, really quickly. So uh, there was unprecedented efficacy uh, in KIT and PDGFR mutated GIST. There is an efficacy of around 95%, which is higher even than chemotherapy for testicular cancer. We had never seen that in solid oncology. Uh, there was moderate toxicity um, compared to chemotherapy uh, still of course and you all know that there is there is still a lot of toxicity but uh, much less than the chemo and the rapid de development and registration uh, path um, the side effects profile was uh, partly different from cml i will come back to that uh, later uh, and so the, the side effects are disease specific with imatinib but uh, there were questions at that time. Uh, what are the long-term anti-tumor and side effects? Nobody knew that. So that's part of drug development. You uh, do your phase one study with a limited follow-up time, and then you see these responses and nobody knows how long. This was a very, uh, very difficult uh, situation, but also an exciting situation um, that we have been through. Um, uh, so I, at that time, I happened to work at one of the phase one centers for, uh, for GIST and I recall calling up patients that were given up and tell them that there was new medication for them. In this graph, uh, you can see on the uh, uh, upper right hand panel, you can see, um, I think you can see my, my pointer here. The historical uh, uh, overall survival of patients with uh, leiomyosarcoma in the past, but also GIST uh, without treatment. So there was a rapid decline in overall survival. And uh, after a half a year, uh, after nine months, 50% of patients already died. And if you look at the phase three study, the overall survival uh, was much, much better and still is much better. 
And it didn't matter if you use 400 or 800 milligrams. I, I think this was a really good study because the standard, the standard arm was not included in the study because there was so much efficacy already in the phase one and two studies. So that is really a novelty because normally you compare the old standard, which is nothing, to the new standard, which is a promising drug. So this way patients could uh, use uh, 400 milligrams for a long time before they have to go to 800 milligrams. And uh, as most of you are patients and some of you use imatinib, you know all about the dose dependent side effects. Um, so that's, that's one thing. And uh, I think one and a half year or two years after the first patient, the drug was registered and 1600 patients were entered Can you hear me again? Yes? Okay. So there was a whole waiting line of patients. And you can imagine these patients had very bulky disease because they had chemo. They had a lot of other uh, treatments before they could reach the moment that they get imatinib. So the, the first patients were patients with, with, with a lot of volume of disease. So if you look at the lower hand panels, these are the uh, the... Uh, the patients that uh, um, with long-term follow-up from the same study and you can see and that was published uh, many years later in 2017 uh, you can see that the effect uh, is prolonged and that there is also uh, about 15 percent of patients that that do not progress so they are sort of cured uh, we know that now and we didn't know that in 2004. So there is more information now. Uh, how to become a long responder. Uh, so um, I, uh, we know now that if you start uh, imatinib with metastatic disease uh, with less bulky disease, you have a bigger chance to, uh, to be a long responder. So it's important to treat on time. Uh, so it's also important to to do a quick diagnosis, don't walk around too long with vague stomach complaints and um, uh, anemia, but get your research done and, 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 and get to a reference center. This panel shows you uh, the Uracan Consortium, which is a European network of reference centers. And um, there are, you, you can find on the website, you can find centers that uh, see a lot of GIST patients. Because it's important that if you are on your, let's say, first line TKI, you stay on it as long as possible. Because right now, and uh, you know that there are four registered or even five registered drugs for uh, TKIs for GIST. You don't want to go too quickly through all these options. Because if you have been through all these options, there is no treatment anymore. So, uh, for instance, if you have isolated progression of one lesion, uh, the multidisciplinary team might consider you for uh, local treatment of this isolated uh, progression before uh, you switch to second line therapies. Uh, adherence is important. Uh, so it's important to take your medicine. Uh, well, I don't have to explain that to you, otherwise you won't be listening, but it's more for the patients that are not here. So the same we see for sunitinib, sutant. Uh, on the left side, you see the registration study. Again, patients with bulky disease, only a 21 week progression-free survival benefit which is uh, much less than half a year, which is, which is not a lot. But if you look at the enormous data set of more than 1,000 patients that received sunitinib in compassion juice programs before it got re registered, you can see already that the uh, median progression-free survival is, is longer. Here it's about one year. And the overall survival is quite long as well. You see one out of five patients that reach second line TKIs 
is uh, still alive after about uh, no almost reaching 10 years so um the reality after the registration times looks uh, better than uh, in the registration studies so um then in the beginning there was the famous bfr 14 trial which is a french trial which uh, I think it, the idea was based on CML because in CML uh, you can stop treatment when you are in remission. And the idea was here to, uh, if you have a good response to imatinib, the patients were randomized to uh, either stop treatment or continue treatment after one, three and five years. So I think there was a good trial to understand the disease better. And um, so, if you uh, progressed after interruption of the imatinib and you had progressive disease again, of course you could restart imatinib. So that was the design of the trial. What are the results? Well, I know it's a busy slide, but uh, of course you, the, the, uh, the slides will, will be distributed or will be on the website later on. You can reread it. But uh, uh, what it showed that almost every patient progressed within that one year of interruption. So the situation was not that good uh, because almost all pa patients progressed. On the other hand, there was a high tumor control rate after reinitiation of treatment, about 96%. So many patients still had uh, their disease under control when you restarted imatinib. So you could say in case of uh, prolonged or uncomfortable side effects, it's an option to discuss with your treating physician. There is one but because uh, sometimes you see rapid progressor progression and a poorer quality of uh, response, a less deeper response after imatinib rechallenge. So if you have, again, if bulky disease, probably it's not a good idea to uh, try to stop. Uh, so officially it's uh, not in the guidelines to interrupt imatinib treatment, but uh, it's better to continue treatment. Um, but there might be individual cases where you try to stop. For instance, I had a patient that wanted to become a uh, father um, and, and there was not much known about uh, the effect on sperm and he just stopped for a while and then uh, later on. But uh, th this is individual situations. So the same happens uh, probably with adjuvant treatment for imatinib. You all know in high risk GISC, so big tumors, high metrotic index, unfavorable primary site, there is a risk of recurrence, usually to the peritoneum or the liver. And if you give uh, three years, which is the standard of imatinib nowadays, if you give three years of treatment, you see a, a, a improved progression free survival. You can see that here. But you see also an improved overall survival. In other words, you cure more patients if you take imatinib. Um, there's one thing uh, that you might know that people are worried about the decline in progression-free survival after stopping the treatment, which is similar after one and three years. So that means that it could be that you delay recurrence of GIST in very high risk uh, uh, GIST. So that's why there is a, a Scandinavian led study uh, right uh, now that's running in most part of Europe where three years of imatinib is compared to five years of imatinib. So maybe you need longer treatment. So what happens with long-term treatment? And this is my second last slide. Um, there was one publication uh, from, from the Netherlands where they do a lot of PK measurements, where you see uh, lower PK levels 
in patients that are being treated for a long time. And nobody knew why. Could it be adherence? Could it be uh, other facts? Uh, maybe auto induction of hepatic enzymes that break down the imatinib quicker. But in the meantime, th there was another study uh, from uh, Asia that uh, contradicted, contradicted uh, these findings. So the book is not closed, uh, but uh, um, my impression is and, uh, that side effects change over time. Adherence is important. It seems to be high, although that's what the patients tell me and what, that's what I believe, of course. Uh, there are psychological for, uh, factors that uh, are important. So if you have metastatic disease and the doctor tells you that you will die of it, not very soon, but after a few years, and you stay alive for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, you have to reshape your life. And um, it, it, it could be even difficult if you expect to die soon and you live for 20 years and you still need to take the medication. So that's very difficult. And probably I don't have to explain that to you. Uh, what you also see if you are in an experience center and you have low volume metastatic disease that the number of scans can be considerably uh, reduced. I have many patients that have only once a year a CT scan when they are um, have their disease under control for a long time. So just it is becoming a chronic illness in certain cases and we have to deal with that. Um, so early side effects, and we will come back to this later in this, uh, this session today, uh, the, the early side effects are usually tumor burden related, gastrointestinal side effects, periorbital edema, sometimes generalized edema, skin rash, uh, and others. And later side effects are, are commonly anemia, muscle cramps, fatigue, and eye symptoms. So the, the, the pattern of side effects changes over time. And um, there are ideas within the EORTC soft tissue and bone sarcoma group to still do a trial maybe after 10 years uh, to stop imatinib and sort of like the BFR trial, but in the pre-selected group of patients with low burden disease and disease under control after 10 years. So, uh, but it's important, and I have many examples of that, of patients that become really old and other diseases are more prominent than, than uh, their metastatic gist. For, for instance, uh, uh, dementia or, uh, or other cancers, or, so it's always important to, to balance treatment for uh, low burden metastatic gist versus uh, other diseases that are uh, compromising quality or length of life. So my conclusion is that just survival is increasing. Quality of life is, becomes just as important. Side effects may change and you can help us because we learn a lot from our patients when they explain that they're taking magnesium for their muscle cramps and that it helps. And we hear that many times the next patient that has cramps, we will advise. It's probably not scientific, but it doesn't do much harm. And if it helps, uh, they're only winners. So get treatment and guidance in reference centers and preferably in studies, because that's how we learn much more about long-term treatment of TKIs. So that's it. And any questions, happy to take.